uh, I'm David Gergen. I want to welcome all of you here to this uh, very special evening. Once again, we have an embarrassment of riches at the Kennedy School. As even as we're gathering here, there are folks over in the forum uh, on a session on Colombia and, and terrorism and the search for peace in Colombia. Another event where I'm proud to say that we at the Center for Public Leadership are happy to be one of the co-sponsors. Uh, but this has been a very special uh, day at the Kennedy School. I think, especially for those of you who have met the winners of this year's uh, Gleitzman Citizen uh, Awards, because they're just uh, they. I, I had a chance to speak to both of them earlier today, and they're uh, they have so much. You know, there's. I, I think the title of tonight is the Fire Within. <laughs> <coughs> And maybe uh, Silbert and, and Mike Farrell, who are being honored here tonight, what, what, uh, what comes through the common denominator in both of them is that somewhere along the way they discovered a fire within. They kept those fires burning for year after year uh, and in such an impressive way. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege to have you both with us. Uh, it's a privilege to have you, Shelley, as well, uh, Mike's wife. Um, let me tell you a bit, just a bit about the evening and introduce the man who has made all of this possible. Uh, Alan Gleitzman is a, uh, was a television entrepreneur. He was born in Brooklyn, was educated at uh, Cornell. And in 1958, well, you can see that. This one went, got, you know, went to grow up in Brookline, part of the time in Dorchester, and then, and then went on to Brookline. Uh, but uh, but uh, Alan uh, went to Cornell, and eventually he moved uh, moved west, Los Angeles, 1958. I believe that's right. Same year the uh, I'm told uh, Scott Scott Webster has reminded me the same year that the uh, the Dodgers moved. Uh, <laughs> it's a good good choice. And and, uh, and by the way, Alan grew up as a great fan of Jackie Robinson. And I think Robinson, in some ways, uh, uh, is, I think, symbolizes what Alan Gleitzman has become about. And that is, he was not only a terrific ball player, but he, was, of course, helped to break the color line in baseball and became a great hero for many as uh, someone who challenged what was then a, a, a social injustice. And, of course, everything, baseball has never been the same since. Uh, Alan Gleitzman uh, has come to believe that social activism is, is central to the progress this country makes. Uh, and that the challenge of social activists to injustices uh, in our society and indeed overseas is, is one of the most important activities that we can recognize as a people. So some years ago, back in 1989, I believe that's right, um, uh, he began a program to recognize each year uh, people who are fighting injustice both in this country and overseas. Uh, he is here with uh, Sherry Roche, who has uh, been his uh, colleague and partner in this effort right from the beginning. He's also a member of the board, the board for the Gleitzman Foundation. Um, and we had a chance to have dinner together out in, out in Los Angeles a few months ago. And I, I heard how much uh, commitment they have to this. Uh, they've been very good friends of the Kennedy School. And one of the things that they had thought for a long time was, would it be nice to bring the winners of these awards each year to the Kennedy School? And so that process has started, started I don't know how long that's been going on, at least a couple of years. Four years. Four years now. Uh, and, uh, and as a result of that, students at the school as well as the faculty have been exposed to some really wonderfully interesting people. And that's especially true tonight. And I, just a word more about, uh, uh, about our connection to the Center for Public Leadership. Uh, I think all of you understand, as, as, uh, as, our, as our center has been getting off the ground, that one of our uh, guiding principles is that leadership is exercised not only by people who are elected officials, but it is indeed uh, exercised by people all through society, whether they're in positions of authority or frequently not in positions of authority, but are agents of change. Uh, and that is exactly what we would like to honor and to understand, both through research and through our teaching. Uh, so it was a natural marriage when the Gleitzmans became so uh, close to the Kennedy School for us to become uh, associated with the Gleitzmans and uh, with Alan and, uh, and the Gleitzman Foundation. And, and so that's why we're here. That's why we're, we're, we, we're delighted and I'm, I'm particularly privileged to introduce Alan. And then he will have the privilege of introducing the awardees. And, and, and I hope we'll, and we will then hear from the awardees because that will be a very special pleasure indeed. Alan.
Thank you, David, uh, both for your kind words and for enabling us to have the awards here this evening. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Holly Sargent and Barbara Kellerman, Scott Webster for all of the work that they did in making this evening come together. Uh, David mentioned Sherry Roche. I'd like to take a minute to introduce her to you because she's such an important part of what we do. Sherry, will you stand up for a moment? And I'd like to thank all of you for your interest in what we're doing. Uh, I think you're going to have a fascinating evening here because our honorees are truly extraordinary activists. Uh, a brief word of what the Gleitzman Foundation is attempting to do. We have one purpose only, and that is to recognize activists and try to motivate others toward activism. And we do this through a series of award programs. This is a Citizen Activist Award for Activism in the United States. Uh, in alternate years, we have the International Award. And uh, in each case, we have an open nomination process, uh, a board of judges of activists that selects the honorees. And then we try to tell their story and we try to show the qualities of courage and tenacity that enable them to succeed with the hope that some of you will then take the torch and run, whether it's for a mile or a marathon, on behalf of some cause that's important to you and that's greater than yourself. So one day someone will come up and say, you know, I attended one of the meetings and I was really inspired by Mike Farrell or maybe Silbert and all, and I thought, I'm pretty upset about something and I'm going to do something about it. So we're, we're waiting for that day. Uh, the events of the past year were a wake-up call to all of us. As terrorism struck our shore, the thought that we could deal with the world's problems at arm's length was shattered. But as a whole new mindset sweeps the country, we are tempted to lose sight of the long, unsolved problems that exist right here in the United States. We must continue to confront them. Discrimination in its many forms persists. Schools decay. Basic needs of food and shelter are unmet. Prosperity for some has masked severe problems for others. In this, the richest country in the world, 31 million people still live in poverty, a disgrace. One out of every seven young people do not graduate high school. One out of every seven do not have medical insurance. And four out of every 10 Americans feel so disenfranchised that they do not even vote. These and other problems must be confronted. Unfortunately, there are some individuals that continue to rise to meet the standards that require action. In the last 13 years, the Gleisman Foundation has honored 200 activists whose efforts both humble and cheer us. None are more inspiring than the two people that you're going to meet here this evening. Mike Farrell, because of the good that he does, is blessed with 48-hour days. <laughs> At least it seems that way when you consider all that he accomplishes. He works at what many would continue, consider a full-time job. He's starring in a weekly television series and acting as vice president of the Screen Actors Guild. Mike calls that his day job. Then he really gets going. As president of Death Penalty Focus, he has played a crucial role in encouraging renewed public questioning of the death penalty. Wherever human rights are endangered, Mike is there to learn, to help, to report. 
His activism has taken him to Bosnia, Rwanda, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Chile, Cuba, Somalia, Croatia, Kenya, Tanzania, and the Middle East. All that he does flows from his core belief in the intrinsic value of each human life and his conviction that to be a responsible citizen, he himself must work to correct injustice. He is a role model to some of the most dedicated activists that I know. It's really a great pleasure to introduce the winner of the Gleisman Foundation 2002 Citizen Activist Award, Mike Farrell. Two parts to this award. Just put that in your pocket. Let me just mention a little about this uh, sculpture. Uh, this was created by Maya Lee. And when I called to ask her to create a, a sculpture for us, the first thing she did, of course, was ask the purpose of the award. And when I told her, she said, well, let me think about that for a few days. And she came back to me and she said that it was her feeling that some extraordinary people can see things more clearly than others, almost as if they are magnified. <laughs> and that is precisely what she, I look pretty good this way. Uh, that she incorporated within the sculpture. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm in an odd position, and, and I, I have to, uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, in, in a couple of ways. First of all, thank you very much, Alan uh, and, and Sherry, for this for considering me for this, for being part of the process that uh, resulted in my being a co-honoree this year. Um, it means more than I can tell you. I, I'm, the oddity is that I'm in a business where a tremendous amount of his attention is heaped on those of us who achieve a certain degree of success. And um, I feel a little um, uh, inappropriate to be singled out in this way uh, when so many other things are, are pointed in my direction. But because my heart is where it is, this touches me more than any award I could think of uh, in my business. So I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I want to thank my beautiful and loving wife, Shelley, for being with me. <laughs> for being with me in every sense of the word. Um, and I want to, if I may indulge myself, I want to thank my brother and sister and my sister-in-law and my cousin and friend who came all the way from Los Angeles just to be here to see this happen. Jim and Kathy and Karen. <clears throat> and I want to congratulate uh, Mimi, who has been a source of inspiration to me for the last 30 years. and. Uh, and continues to be, and will continue to be, and uh, to Gerald, and Abe, and Freddie, and Stephanie, and all of the others who you represent, uh, to, because you're walking examples of the fact that, <clears throat> that my belief that human beings are capable of transformation uh, is grounded in fact, and not in fancy. I'm also enormously moved to be in the Kennedy Center. Forgive me, um, John Kennedy was the, <clears throat> was the first president I was old enough to vote for. He was and remains an inspiring figure in my life. And the idea that this award is being presented in the Kennedy School of Government, uh, as you can see, moves me uh, uh, beyond uh, 
beyond what might be expected. <clears throat> I, I want to I want to say essentially three things, um, but it'll take me more than a couple of minutes to say them. Uh, uh, what moves us, I think, us, I will deign to speak for more than myself, but what moves us is a question I, I raised in, a, in an essay I wrote, and I just want to offer that for your consideration. If you imagine <clears throat> that you lived in a country that provided an example of human possibility for the rest of the world, imagine that the fundamental premise of this country praised the inherent beauty, value, and dignity of every individual human being. Imagine that the promise of this country inspired hope in the breasts of men and women everywhere to reach upward for something higher and better than anything they'd ever known. Imagine the future that an opportunity such as this land embodied could create in the hearts and minds of hopeful human beings. Imagine what could be created out of such a land if nurtured and further inspired by courageous, intelligent, compassionate, and hopeful leadership whose view was ever upward, ever outward. Imagine then this shining star, this limitless opportunity shunted onto a siding, power wasting, vision fogging, hope diminishing, dreams dying because of the rot of smugness, greed, weakness, an absence of empowering spirit. Imagine the cancer of leaders lacking inspiration, of weak-willed, power-mad, self-satisfied, possibility-denying rulers who lost in the excrement of their own frustrated desires lacked the power of curiosity and the courage of love and instead bludgeoned hope by the example of fear. Imagine then the sense of loss, the frustration, the enormous pit of despair that could encompass those who had once known possibility. Imagine the great tide of hopelessness that would appear, the cynicism that would follow, and the negligence that would result. The, um, the Latin root of the word negligence means not connecting, not connecting actions to consequences, not connecting oneself to others. And when I think of the people who fit the description that I just, uh, that I just gave you, uh, I wonder what our job is with regard to them. And I found in a book, a novel actually, written by a lawyer <clears throat> called Harmful Intent, this phrase, in cynical times, right and wrong can be hard to sort out. Goodness and truth can seem beyond our reach, but we have the obligation, the option, to put cynicism aside and exercise the public virtues to find truth, oppose wrong, protect innocence, promote good, and do right. I think those, are, uh, those, those provide a kind of manifesto for those of us who are interested in being active citizens, active members of this society. Maya Angelou said that without courage we cannot practice any other virtue with consistency. We can't be kind, true, merciful, generous, or honest. Uh, David asked us earlier about courage. Um, without it, we are not who we can be. As a young man, I went through a difficult time that, as difficult times often do, made a profound difference in my life. In immense emotional pain as a result of a breakup of my marriage, uh, I was directed by friends to a place then known as the Manhattan Project. Unlike the creation of the atom bomb, the Manhattan Project concerned itself with the creation of people. It was funded by the Salvation Army, a program that was developed largely through the work of a caring psychologist and the experiences of reforming drug addicts and alcoholics and those with other social disabilities. At the house, as we called it, uh, people in pain were brought face to face with themselves through very tough group therapy sessions and exercises and socialization. And as one of the leaders and founders of this organization said, this is not rehabilitation. These people were never habilitated in the first place. This is a habilitation process. We were taught there to understand that the responsibility for our lives was our own that attempting to pass off that responsibility onto bad luck or the circumstances of life or uncaring or abusive parents, the system or hostile authorities was, uh, was meaningless and a self-serving cop-out. The problems we were dealing with were our own. And if we could find the courage to deal with them head on with honesty and integrity, we could not only solve them and go on to become contributing productive citizens, but in a real sense, 
we would be virtually unstoppable. The fundamental premise of the house was that all human beings want the same thing. Everyone wants to be loved, to be respected, and to have attention paid. Growing up in a situation in which one is deprived of these things creates an imbalance in the person who, absent that love and attention and respect, often finds ways to scheme, to gain, to conspire, to get them, or to get something that passes for them. And these schemes and games and conspiracies only result in different forms of living a lie, and they lead to self-degradation, despair, misery, and death, often the death of the soul before that of the body. The answer we were taught is to get to your core and understand who you are, to face that reality, accept it, learn to love it, and then learn to tell the truth. Standing up and asking for what you want, having the courage to ask for what you want, an idea that incorporates the willingness to risk opening yourself to another and accepting the possibility of being rejected by her or him, is the path to selfhood and freedom. Comprehending and ultimately in internalizing those simple truths is not an easy task, but it can make a powerful difference in one's life. Learning them as I did from drug addicts and con artists and drunks and whores, people thought of then and sadly still today as social detritus offers one a, a quite different perspective on society and ultimately on the world in which we live. There are many stories I could tell you that would exemplify the lessons I learned in the house, but, but let me only offer this one. Once I became part of the responsible group um, at the house, people we, who first came there were deemed stupid, uh, as in too stupid to know what to ask for and uh, too stupid to know what they wanted. And then when they demonstrated the ability to be so, they were deemed responsible. As a responsible person, I was part of a team that went into prisons to talk to those inmates who might want to come out and into a program such as ours instead of going back to the neighborhood that uh, had prompted them into the lives that had led them into prison in the first place. One man who came to the house was a con artist, an embezzler, a thief, a recidivist, many times in prison. He, uh, he was also, while not misshapen, um, a very homely man with uh, protruding teeth and a slightly off face and deeply pocked skin. He was not grotesque, but he was certainly unattractive in, in, in our sense of the term. He was a tough guy to get to. The sessions with him were very hard, certainly uh, often exercises in futility. But one night after much, much work, much caring, thoughtful, insisting that there was something further than what he was offering us, he had a breakthrough and he began to open up and he wept and he wept. And he talked about his life and the choices he'd made and never got to why he'd made those choices, but finally he said if he could only get his life straight with our help and the help of his own uh, uh, motivating influences, what he always wanted to do was work with the blind. And I thought in that moment, here's a prescription for what makes somebody go wrong and what makes somebody go right. And that the value our society imposes are sometimes very difficult for some of its members to live with. And I think we as a, as a people need to understand that and reach out in that understanding. All any human being wants is to be loved, to be respected, and have attention paid. I've tested that premise in many ways since uh, that time, and I was lucky enough uh, to have spent the time I was lucky enough to have spent with those folks, the dregs of society, as my mother or father might have thought. I've traveled to out-of-the-way places, as Alan has suggested, some of them the prisons and death rows here in America, some of them other arenas of despair, pits of oppression, wars and death camps and other parts of the world. And I always, always find that the lessons that those misfits, those social throwaways taught me were true. I always find that, and I always find inspiration and some reason to, to press on. I was in, uh, as Alan suggested, I was in Rwanda in January of 1995. As you know, a genocidal war had taken place there some months before. And I visited there a church, the church at Ntarama, where hundreds of been people had been lured in by the uh, radio broadcast telling them they would there be safe. And once there, trapped, they were massacred. 
Um, I went back to my hotel room that night and I wrote what I was feeling and I'd like to offer it for your consideration. Everything I believe was challenged by the infernal tableau displayed in this place. Though the three buildings and the yard between them were also full of remains that one had to tread carefully, the chapel somehow presented the most soul-bruising image. Probably because one clings to the hope that it does represent on some level the salvation, the deliverance from evil that these poor slaughtered wretches were seeking. Piles of bones, the outline of the body they once supported still defined by the ragged remnants of their clothing lay where they came to rest, tossed, strewn about by the force of the blast, the bullet, the thrust of the spear, blow of the club, swipe of the machete, again and again and again of the machete. Books, canes, toys, purses, thermos bottles, shreds of the last things they, let, they held, those that their murderers left behind, punctuate the sentences of death written by these heaps of what were once vital beings. The air, suffused with a thick, hideously sweet, cloying, web-like quality, is almost impossible to breathe. It is as if, having stepped into a charnel house, a human abattoir, I'm caught between here and somewhere else, between this dimension and another. And to bring this horror into my nose, mouth, lungs, is to invite in corruption. This holy place, and it clearly was that to those who sought refuge here, is now mute testimony to the unholy. What moves here, what this intruder can see and hear, are the roaches, lizards, and others that find their sustenance in the leavings. But what exists here, what insists that it be heard, is the faint echo of the shrieks and moans of the dying as they compete with the grunts and exclamations of those who did this terrible work. The delicate puff of a hand, the, uh, of, of, of the air from a hand reaching out, fingers curling in despair, the hiss of the blade on its downward path, the final sigh of release from those who expected more. If there is in man that divine spark, it has here been crushed, spat upon, reviled, denied. Has it been extinguished? Can it be? Will we allow it to be? Clearly that was a hideous experience, and it's one that no one should have to see or hear about or certainly experience themselves. But walking among the remains across the grounds and through the chapel itself, stepping carefully to avoid the further defiling these poor souls, trying not to breathe in the suffocating over odor of decay, I was face to face with the mind-altering horror of promiscuous death and somehow closer to the presence of God. As horrible, as painful, as overwhelming as it was, it was at the same time, in, in, a, in a way difficult to understand, somehow liberating. And there among the hundreds of human beings was a particular sight that stays with me. The skeleton of one man, still partly wrapped in the garments he wore when he was felled, obviously running his arms and legs in a posture of a runner. He was a gruesome tableau of motion. Not far away in the direction he was apparently heading, the skeletons of a number of children had been gathered around a pile of their skulls. And I determined for myself that this man had been killed while running to the aid of a child, perhaps his own, perhaps that of someone else. And I realize, having thought of this man many times, that my hope is that when my time comes, that like him, I am blessed enough to be able to go to my death while in the act of striving to help another. Thank you. night. I don't know if there's something in the air or in our smog, but our other honoree is also a Californian and, <laughs> and another legend. 31 years ago, 
Mimi Silbert and her partner, the late John Maher, am I saying it correctly? Sure. Okay. <laughs> founded the Delancey Street Foundation, which is now considered the nation's leading self-help residential education center for substance abusers and other ex-convicts. Headquartered in San Francisco, it is still guided by Dr. Silbert and now has more than 1,000 residents in five locations throughout the country. By tapping business work ethics and traditional values, it has successfully made winners out of those just struggling to survive. 15,000 men and women have graduated into society as productive citizens. The center is essentially run by its residents, and Mimi likes to say we're just as selective as Harvard. <laughs> Harvard selects only the top one or two percent, and we select only the bottom one or two percent. <laughs> it's my very great pleasure to introduce the Gleitzman Foundation 2002 Citizen Activist Award honoree, Dr. Mimi Silver. Take the money and run. <laughs> Putting this here. I actually am thrilled to receive this award. And I think I can allow myself to be that level of thrilled because truthfully and, and in no way modestly, I don't accept it for me because I am lucky enough to have spent 30, God, it's already 31, it's bad enough that it was 30, 31 years living with the people who really do run this organization, and therefore, I simply am the pass-through. I'm receiving an award on behalf of people who really are what society considers the losers in America. And we, interestingly, like the Manhattan Project people, you know, there are many ways to begin to deal with all of the social problems. And if you're a person who, as our residents do, embody every social problem that exists, you can either go through carefully with euphemisms for all of these issues, or you can just embrace the awful words that you know the worst of the people are throwing at you and about you when you're not around. And that's why I laughed when you, when Mike was talking about how he was with this group when the, the first group of people was stupid. That's how you came in. They were known as stupid. And then they became responsible. You know, you people would not dare to call anybody stupid. Um, you're not allowed to. You're at Harvard. Um, <laughs> these people s are at risk for not having had the benefit of the finest education, or whatever <laughs> it is <laughs> that you would have to say. But we can't waste our time with that. And so we embrace the words that people throw around 
with scorn. And we at Delancey Street start out by saying the people who come to Delancey Street really are the losers. We are the people that most of society has been throwing out. And there are statistics that describe the population. But since I live there, I have to tell you, don't let yourself understand social sciences and don't let yourself understand life by way of the statistics. Because every number is a human life. Pause along the way. There is no way to capture what is going on in America and what it feels like to be the underbelly of society by hearing the numbers and reading the statistics and talking about things, you know, how, how many people are recidivating or recidivating or res having recidivism <laughs> thrust upon them. Um, I went straight through school because I was an overachiever because I come from an immigrant family, a family that sacrificed a lot and that believed a lot that the children were the promise and that it was worth the struggle because we, the kids, were going to live out the dream. And I was lucky enough to have parents who turned themselves inside out so that we could move from Dorchester, Dorchester, <laughs> uh, to Brookline. And in Brookline, everybody worried whether it is that they were going to go to Harvard or MIT or perhaps Columbia or maybe Georgetown. <laughs> and the people left behind in Dorchester were still worrying how it is that they were going to get out. And many of them never got out and some of my really close friends from those early years ended up in jail by a flip of the coin. I ended up going to school and going to more school uh, and doing anything I could to learn and help. And I was teaching in the School of Criminology. Interestingly, I was teaching a class on the prison industrial complex in the 60s and waving my arms about and talking about racism and the horror and the statistics and the recidivism and what we had to do uh, to change the world. And then I went to actually work in a prison. And then I began to learn something about what it felt like to live the life that I was teaching about. And in 30 years of living in Delancey Street, I continue to learn to never forget what it feels like to be that newcomer. You come into Delancey Street in numbers of ways. You can walk in on your own and just sit yourself on a bench that we have and we wake somebody up, one of the residents, and they come down, they do an interview. The interview is they ask you, what's the matter? And you essentially say, I screwed up my life. I need help. You don't mean it. We know you don't mean it. <laughs> but you have to say it because you have to take that first step and ask for help. But the majority of our interviews are done in jail. And you're in jail and you're awaiting sentence, and sometimes you've been there many times before. Our average resident, if I can intersperse the statistics 
with the story. Our average resident has 18 felony convictions in a state, California, where you are now put in prison for life for three felony convictions. That's what they mean by three strikes, you're out. Nobody asks on the three strikes, you're out bill, what about the pitches? Because see, to have three strikes, damn it, you're supposed to have three good pitches. The people who come to Delancey Street have not had three good pitches. But they've had a lot of strikes. And we go to the jails, and we often get, nowadays, we get a lot of people facing life in prison. And we get a lot of judges with the Kazatskis to say, yes, I know I'm supposed to sentence them. It's mandatory. But you know what? I'm sending them to Delancey Street. I'm giving them this one shot. And we have lots of district attorneys willing to take a look through the glass and say, I don't see 18 strikes. Uh, I see one or two felonies, and therefore, I'm going to give them a chance. You know, along the way to make anything possible, it takes people with guts willing to stand up and say, something strikes me as wrong here, and so I'm going to be a piece of the solution. And when the people come in, to Delancey Street. They come in, here are their statistics. They are illiterate or functionally illiterate. They have never worked at any job, let alone a skilled job, for even as long as six months. They have no work habits. They are third generation now, criminal and drug addict. I gave you the 18 felony convictions. They've been in and out, in and out, in and out, repeatedly of prison. So they're really not good criminals. Uh, those people are running corporations. In California, it's pretty difficult to go into the prison system and not join a gang by race. Our prisons are pretty much formed around racial gangs. And so if you weren't a racist going in the door, then a few years in prison just simply to survive, you end up in a gang by race, and that's your definition for life. It's always been fascinating to me. Abe, one of the people here who's Puerto Rican and uh, African American, and uh, but he's brown colored, and so he joined the Mexican Mafia. You know, and then was a definitive Mexican, and anyone that wasn't a Mexican, uh, he was sworn to kill, and that's really, the actuality of the gangs. I, when people get to Delancey Street, I try to debunk all that very serious stuff they have. And we make jokes about this. And I, you know, you have to make jokes when your reality is horrible. Uh, one of the things, for example, I say to the Aryan Brotherhood people who are there with the swastikas crawling all over their necks and ears and sometimes on their foreheads is that obviously they didn't really understand the issue because I didn't, you know, I tell them, I don't know if you've ever looked in the mirror, but you are not what Hitler meant by the master race. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it's true. Uh, <laughs> And they would be joining, unfortunately, many of my relatives in those ovens. But you know, they don't know those things in prison. And the awful reality is everybody, everybody needs to be a somebody. I mean, all of us, wherever we find it, in our family, in our work, Somewhere in our world, we have to be a somebody. 
And one of the greatest horrors of prison is not that it's a cage. It's not that you lose all of the things that you have when you go in. Because you know how many people are tattooed, born to lose on their arm? These are people who, who don't have anything to lose. Like prison would be awful for the people who thought it up. Because these people have lives and they're losing everything, giving it up and walking in. The people who go into prison are pretty much the underclass. They are going to an awful place, but they're there with all their friends and their values and the things they understand the most, anger and bitterness and vengeance. Uh, you know, Mike, Mike works to abolish the death penalty. I thought of this today when we were talking to the student reporter from the Harvard Crimson. And among our graduates, 10,000 of them have left gang violence behind. You know, they first come into Delancey Street and the face is scrunched up and it's full of hatred and anger and vengeance. And the entire concept of the gang is to get vengeance. It's a fascinating concept because no one that I know or has I've ever met started the violence. Everyone is reacting to somebody else's violence. All the gang people are taking vengeance and they're doing street justice. And that's the word they use, justice. Justice must be done. It's hard to tell the difference, except some people are our elected public officials, and these people are gang members. The language, quite frankly, is the same. And so I offer, I offer it through David because he's um, the most well-connected <laughs> to the public <laughs> leaders of the country. If we have been able to turn around hitmen for gangs who have committed their lives to violence and vengeance for their race and teach them nonviolence and teach them how to make a family with people of other races, how to lean on each other and teach each other and help each other, how to understand how important it is to give up hatred, to let it go, get past it, become decent and forgiving. If we can teach these gang members with 18 violent felonies to not take vengeance, we can teach the United States government. So I offer the Delancey model <laughs> to those leaders who still believe that somehow it helps the victim to kill someone else. But in any case, these people come in to Delancey Street and they are full of hatred and they are violent and they don't believe, and all their instincts are self-destructive. You know, they're compulsive dope fiends. Uh, I differentiate. I guess there are somewhere in the middle and upper classes drug addicts. They are different. Our people are dope fiends. Those people can get $100,000 and I guess put it in the bank and off of the interest they, they perhaps take a fix. And, if you give any resident of Delancey Street $100,000, they'll take the $100,000 and put it all into their arms and they'll OD. And they know that ahead of time. It isn't a matter of drug education. They're not sitting weighing the options. Let's see, should I become an engineer or should I become a dope fiend on the street going into garbage cans? Um, it's a, it's a compulsive behavior, 
and it's a behavior of people who don't plan and think of options. And the unbelievable courage, I don't know how to tell you the amount of courage it takes. I watch them. Every instinct they have is cynical. And it says, who's she? And I don't want to listen to her. And why do I have to do this? And this is all bullshit. And yet, there's a teeny little piece. And we grab that little piece. And while every instinct is saying to them, go to the left, go to the left, go to the left, and I'm blinking, saying, see, if you only walk to the right, it'll be difficult. It's like ice skating for the first time. You're here in Boston. Uh, some of you are not from Boston. I know the, the, the woman that interviewed us. She's from Miami. Well, they don't have ice in Miami. I still remember first learning to ice skate, and I think of it constantly when I watch the residents, because in order to ice skate, you have to give up everything you know. Otherwise, what you'll do is walk around the rink <laughs> repeatedly, <laughs> except now you're on skates. <laughs> In order to ice skate, you have to do something stupid. You have to not walk and slide and fall on your ass. <laughs> because that's what happens the first time you do anything that's difficult and new. Now, obviously, I don't mind looking like a jerk. But most of the people that come into Delancey Street, their image is all they got left. And they don't want to slide because they know they're not going to look beautiful. They're going to fall. And yet you'll never ice skate if you're not willing to take that risk and look foolish and make a lot of mistakes. And I watch people for no reason that I can think of. It's not like they really say, oh, good, now I'm going to have a chance to go to school and be good. And they don't believe any of that's possible yet. And they, and they do it anyway. Not that they don't spend a lot of time walking around the rink, but one day, one Tuesday, not a special day, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, each resident stops for a minute saying, this is all bullshit. And they secretly believe. And at that moment, everything changes. To be part of that is, I think, probably the greatest privilege a human being can have. And I've been lucky enough to be part of that for 31 years. I've watched people get, become, you know, we have graduates who have become the head of the San Francisco Housing Council. We have graduates who have gone on to be members of the Board of Supervisors. We fought to get ex-felons the right to vote, and did. We fought to get the first ex-felon admitted to the bar, and did. We fought to get the first ex-felon a real estate license. I don't know that these are all good things, you know, that they're choosing <laughs> law and real estate and stuff. But anyway, they're entitled to make the same mistakes that you're entitled to make. <laughs> and every door that was opened is just incredible 
for that person it was a miracle. For all the young kids that come into Delancey Street now and become realtors, uh, Freddie, who's here, is a, you know, he got his real estate license. I'm sure he didn't think about the fact that it was a Delancey Street resident before him that couldn't get one because he was an ex-felon and we fought it and we fought it and we fought it. And the doors that Freddie is going to open, other residents that we don't know yet are going to walk through. It's an amazing organization that has no staff and no funding. I recommend this to anyone who wants to start a nonprofit. That's how we started. We determined that people who have been passive recipients their entire lives, they've received welfare. Some people think too much, some people think not enough. But the worst part of it is they just receive. They've received therapy, they've received punishment, they've received analysis, and they're busy receiving statistics left and right of people who are analyzing and understanding them. But you know, what makes you feel good? Every one of you, it's the things you do, not the things that are done to you or for you. It's you doing something that gives you your sense of who you are and your pride. And that word my profession loves so much your self-esteem. But you know, you can't sit in a group and give someone self-esteem. Like you just can't say, I feel really good about you. You're a good person. <laughs> you know, you're sitting there. The truth is, we all know what we do. Uh, whatever we're conning inside, we know ourselves. And we judge ourselves. And when we earn our own self-respect is when we begin to have self-esteem. And I learned about hope. A lot of people believe that you can't help people unless they have some hope for themselves, unless they somehow are willing and want something different. And at Delancey Street, I watched until I saw people can't hope because they don't understand hope. It's, it's like chocolate ice cream, if, if somehow you've never had chocolate ice cream, which if that's true, I feel worse for you than I do for anybody who has ever come into Delancey Street because I couldn't live without chocolate ice cream. But if you live in despair, and, and anger, and understand what it means to be a third generation criminal and drug addict. It means your grandma is telling you, as grandmothers do of our residents, they write letters saying, when are you getting out of that goddamn place? Come back to the gang and sell that dope. Your family needs the money. What do you think you're doing? And when that's your grandmother, it is really impossible to understand little blinky-eyed people like me saying, but you can be somebody good. You can be somebody decent. It's, it's a different world. In prison, these people are somebodies. And on the streets, they're somebodies. Now, there's somebody mean and there's somebody nasty. But that mean, nasty quality is what has given them their status. And we're asking them, hope for something different. So the way we run Delancey Street is what we call the act as if theory. It's an each one teach one place. Every resident is in charge of teaching a newer resident 
what they've just learned. If you read at the fifth grade level, you're tutoring someone who reads at the second grade level, and they're showing somebody this is the letter B, B. And you're being tutored by somebody who reads at the eighth grade level, and that person's being tutored by somebody, and on and on and on. Like a good Irish Catholic family. The 17-year-old is taking care of the 16-year-old who's taking care of the 15-year-old <laughs> on down. It's a sense we talk about empowerment, but if you do two people or four people, then you are the one being empowered. When I was a prison psychologist, when I first went in, and I was driving home, and I remember leaving the prison and feeling awful. Oh, God, you know, they're still locked up, and I'm here in my car going home. But, but actually, I thought, you know, what a good girl Mimi is. She's helping all these people, and they're all saying thank you. Um, and one day I thought, who, who wants to be the other side of that? Who wants to be the person whose life is saying thank you to someone else for your life? Everybody wants to be the person to whom people say thank you. And that's the basis of our organization. Everyone is the therapist. Everyone is the teacher. Everyone is saying thank you to someone. And everyone is having thank you said to them. And after some successes, after you begin to see that you actually cared about someone, at first you only acted as if you cared. And then, like I said, some Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you don't know why, but this person's life mattered to you. And you really gave a damn if they were going to make it or not make it. And it wasn't, you weren't just running canned data anymore. We talk about the fact that our football team never loses. <laughs> And that in addition to academic skills, we provide three vocational skills for everyone so they know how to fix a car and build a building and do finances. And that we don't just kick them out when it's time to graduate, but they get a job and friends and a car and they ease their way to transition out. And that our bottom 2% damn it, are capable of everything that your top two percent are capable of. And they have each other as a network, just as you have one another as a network. And we try to make that network open as many doors as we can. And so for people who come in the door believing that their society's garbage, and believing that they're losers, and believing that they're nobodies. To get the confirmation that this award is, that says to them, come to Harvard and stand in front of the top 2% and have them honor you for your courage, for the incredible guts and heart and soul that it takes to not only transform your own life, but to build an organization that's transforming the lives of thousands of people you don't even know yet. This award and having it at my first president, too, the Kennedy School, and having it witnessed I mean, this man has taught presidents how to act.
it, I just don't know how to explain to you how much it means um, to people who feel like nobody's to get this confirmation that indeed they really are somebody's decent somebody's with integrity and courage and legitimacy and real success. And so on behalf of all our residents, all our graduates, and all the people on the streets and in the prisons who one day we hope will come to us or to a place modeled after us, um, thank you. Can I ask A. Birizari and Freddie Baca and Stephanie Muller and Gerald Miller? They are four residents of Delancey Street. They are what we're talking about to stand because. That's who's getting this award. Talking about a hard act to follow. Whoa. Oh. One couldn't help but think, as Mike Farrell and, and Mimi Silbert were talking, uh, what choices they made in life. Mike Farrell could have walked around for the rest of his days, being known as Captain B.J. Hunnicutt. People still recognize him on the street. Everybody who watched MASH knows Mike Farrell. He could have led a very comfortable life. And he made a moral choice to do something different. And he different went a different way. And he put his life on the line, literally, in places like Bosnia and Rwanda and other places like that. And you think of Mimi Sober, she had two PhDs, two PhDs, and was teaching on the faculty at Berkeley when she made a choice, a moral choice. And she took two young kids, her two children, and moved into this early part of Delancey Street and for five years lived out of boxes. He had her clothes in boxes in a one-room apartment to make this work. That's the kind of choice she made. So I, I, think, I, I think the message tonight for all of the students here especially, but for all of us, is to ask ourselves what choices we make. I think that's what you challenged us to do as you go forward, because we do have so much privilege. I would ask on behalf of our center We've been talking to Alan Gleitzman about what additional things the Kennedy School should be doing to encourage citizen activism, what we should be doing to study it, to understand it, to help students here uh, uh, consider those options uh, more fully, to be engaged, to have opportunities beyond the building. If you have ideas, uh, we would welcome them because we're in the conversations about that. So we would welcome your ideas about what more the Kennedy School could do. And finally, I would ask you to make one other choice. One day you'll be in San Francisco, and when you are, walk down Market Street, go down toward the, go down toward the bay. When you get down there and you see the ferry terminal, turn right, walk a few blocks, and you'll come across this great big, huge red brick complex, 400,000 square feet, and go have a meal there. I'll tell you from personal experience, it'll be one of the most memorable meals you'll ever have in your whole life. And if you're lucky, you'll meet Gerald Miller there. And our final treat tonight, Gerald Miller is one of the residents to Lancy Street, and we leaned over and said, would you mind saying a few words while you're here? Tell us about Delancey Street from personal experiences. Sir, we welcome you to the kind school. this. Um, one of the things that Mike said was that um, we're on a first name basis now. <laughs> he said that um, he found himself in an odd position 
I'm really in an odd position. <laughs> a few years ago, I was in uh, Folsom State Prison, um, and I couldn't go anywhere. Now I'm speaking at Harvard, and you can't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's a total, total turnaround. Um, it's incredible. I came to Delancey Street um, the way most people come to Delancey Street. My life was just a total and complete wreck. Um, I grew up in New York. My mom got killed when I was really young. Um, my dad died a few years later. I grew up in the streets, and that's what I knew and that's what I learned. I wound up in California in, prison, in the prison system, and um, I joined a prison gang not too long after I got into prison. And that's, I just continued to do what I did. I was nasty, I was mean, I was violent. I hated everybody. And I did that for most of my adult life. The last time I was arrested, um, there was a guy who told me, he was a lawyer actually, I have no idea how I kept his license, but he told me, if you don't, if you don't get into Delancey Street, basically you're gonna spend the rest of your life in prison. So I wrote this letter to Delancey Street and a guy came out and interviewed me. And I put on my best little social worker smile and I said, I'm really sorry and I was a terrible human being and I really, I'm a poor black kid and I need a break. And he said, okay, well, you know, you have to understand though, I know you're full of shit. <laughs> and I was, I mean, it wasn't, but I knew it was my only way out. And I, I went to Delancey Street and it was the hardest thing I ever did in life because at every turn, there was somebody basically on top of me trying to fix me. And I didn't want to be fixed because I didn't think I was broken. You know, and they you know, were telling me how to walk, how to speak, I had to go to school, and I had to help people, which was like, I didn't get that part. <laughs> I said, what does this have to do with me having a drug problem? They said, well, you don't have a drug problem. That's not the problem. The problem is you don't know how to live. And if you learn how to care about people, and if you learn how to be decent, then you won't have to use drugs. And I didn't really believe it, um, but I figured, what the hell, I don't have anything to lose, so I'll try it anyway. And it took a really long time, because I made a lot of mistakes, even in Delancey Street. Uh, in Delancey Street. I mean, my life was a big mistake. But I stuck it out, and one thing I found out was that I could be forgiven for my mistakes, and that every mistake wasn't the end of the world. And it took a long time for me to get that. It took a long time for me to get that I had to help, so that, that I wasn't the only person on the planet that mattered. Um, I was in a room, like when you first come to Delancey Street, you're in a room with like 10 other people. And they come from prison gangs that I had sworn to kill. I slept right next door to, um, right next in the bed next to me with a guy um, from the Aryan Brotherhood who any place else in life, we would have tried to destroy each other. Abe is now my best friend and I didn't really care too much for the Mexican Mafia either. Um, <laughs> So I had to learn all these things. I had to learn because I'd never worked a day in my life. I had to learn how to get up for work in the morning. That was kind of hard shit. I mean, that was like really difficult because <laughs> I didn't get it. I was late and I'd get, you know, people would tell me, you, can't, you have to be on time. You have to be responsible. You have to be accountable. These words didn't mean anything to me, but I was, I would parrot, you know, because that's the way we operate. It's the each one teach one. So every time somebody told me something, I would go find a newcomer because I was tired of them telling me to go help somebody. I would go, look, you have to go help somebody out. You have to go teach somebody something. I didn't know what I was saying. But as I stayed in Delancey Street, I actually, at f first I didn't think I needed to change, but I actually started to change. And it wasn't like any, like one moment. It was that I thought maybe I could do something different because I'd gone to school, I got my GED, I'd gotten off a of little, what we call maintenance, which is basically, pretty much a no-brainer. You just have to figure out how to sweep, mop, clean, get along with people, not hurt people, not be nasty to your boss for, you know, as long as it takes for you to do that. And I did all of these little things and I started to feel like there was a possibility I could do something else. And then I wanted to do something else because I saw a lot of people who I had known that were in prison gangs and that I had known on the streets that were real dope fiends. Um, these weren't people who were at risk, everybody else was at risk when they were around. <laughs> so, so I saw them doing different things and I figured, well, secretly, if they can do it, I can do it. And, you know, I just wanna um, 
say thanks to Mimi for having faith in me, and um, it, it's it, it's because nobody ever believed in me. I mean, really, I, w I was I hadn't earned anyone's trust, and no one would believe in me, and there was you know no, nothing to believe in. Um, and it was really difficult trying to make a change, but I'm glad I did, and I'm glad you believed in me. She just handed me a check for more money I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know what I mean? No one in life would ever go, here, Gerald, here's $50,000. Let's go take that. And my only thought is to make sure it gets back to Delancey Street. <laughs> it's, um, I won't keep you all night, because I just want to say thank you for having us, and thank you for our award, and thank you for everything. this evening, you better check your pulse. <laughs> uh, I just am so proud that we could have helped in some way in bringing these people here, recognize what they've done, hopefully encourage others. Uh, when we speak of activism, we really speak of it on a much smaller plane than what we've seen here tonight. These are the top, the plus ultra. But we could all do something. So I, I hope you are inspired. Thank you very much.